Oh, that the Lord would guide my ways to keep his statutes still. Oh, that my God would grant me grace to know and to do his will. Make me to walk in your commands. That's a delightful road. Nor let my head or heart or hands offend against my God. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we seek to to know God's will and and to know what it means to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, and what it means to carry that out, to ask God to help us not do anything offensive, but to but to follow His ways. That I, my head, my hand, my heart, all of me is about following Him. I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter five. I would invite you to do that. You'll find Matthew chapter five on page portion we're at on page 1503 in your pew Bible. That's important for you to do because you need to see this sermon all together. Jesus didn't preach this in in portions, but we've got a a, a section of preaching where Jesus kind of builds on one thing to the next. So starting out at the beginning of chapter five, we have Jesus' first uh, really recorded sermon. Um, He starts out with the Beatitudes, the blessed parts. And we looked at those and said, what, what Jesus is really saying is when we recognize that we're poor in spirit, we are blessed because we know we need to seek Uh, to be filled up and to get our wealth from someplace else and besides this world. We are blessed when we recognize that we're going to mourn. There's going to be mourning that we're going to do on this earth. There's going to be things that are going to make us cry. We are blessed when we hunger and thirst for what is right. To not gloss that over, but but to do that. We are blessed in all that. We are blessed even in being persecuted for Christ's sake. That is truly a blessing to have that right relationship with God and therefore wanting to follow that. So what is that mean for our lives? Well, later on in that Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus says this, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Came up into baptism as we lit those candles, right? Jesus reminding us that for Nathaniel and Jacob, they now too are lights to the world. You and I are as well through our baptism, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are salt and light to the world. So what does that look like? Well, turn to Matthew 5. Verse 38, and Jesus is going to explain that to us. So Matthew 5, verse 38, it starts out this way. Well, first of all, Jesus is describing life in the sinful world, life in a fallen world. Like that, the example of the children's lesson, you and I are lights, and we're lights because it's a dark world, and we see that darkness every single day. It isn't necessarily a physical darkness. It's the darkness of sin that we see around us. Turn on the news, read the newspaper, see the news. It's another war. It's another person being murdered. It's people not treating each other well. It's stuff you see every day at school, in your workplace, people cutting corners, cheating, All of this that's going on, it really truly is a dark world. But this is life as a Christian, as light in that dark world. What does it look like? And he starts out this way. He says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, Jesus says. Now I'll ask you a question. Who said that? Who said eye for eye and tooth for tooth? You maybe know, but actually it's recorded three times in Scripture. God said it. God said that, and on the surface we look at that and say, boy, that's pretty barbaric, isn't it? Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But let me tell you what God was saying to us there. He was saying, actually, if you look at it closely, we must limit the way that we retaliate. In other words, he's limiting, think about it this way. If someone does you something bad and you say, I'm going to get back at you, do you usually get back to them in the same way that they did something to you? Or do you say, you did this to me, I'm going to do something to you 10 times worse. So Jesus is limiting, their God is limiting their retaliation. He's also saying too, that everything we do, our actions are important. They have consequences and every single person is important to God. So therefore every action that we do against someone else, they are worth, they are worth being recognized and there being some kind of eye for eye and tooth for tooth. God is also saying he recognizes the fallenness of our world, that there need to be consequences to our actions, and he's meeting out and saying, you are all important, and so there's consequences to what you do. And with those words, he starts out. But then, Jesus makes a radical uh, tug on our life 
and the kind of actions that come out of us now because of the relationships that we have around us. So look at the next few verses. In verse 39 and following, he says, but I tell you, this is Jesus talking, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Well, now Jesus is talking about relationships. He's talking about those relationships that you and I have in our world and and relationships to the people there. We shouldn't be surprised that Jesus is giving us some direction on relationships because he says, you are to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Who are you that to? But the people that are around you. And so the people that are around you, think about who that is that you're around every single day. And it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus would give us direction on relationships because think about it. Ever since the fall of mankind recorded in the Bible, when Adam and Eve fall away from God, when they eat of the fruit, look at what happens to relationships. First of all, their relationship with God. Adam and Eve hide from God right? Their relationship with God has been changed. We try to hide from God too, right? Like, like I'll be a good, nice Christian on Sunday morning, but you know, when I get in the real world at my school or my job, then things are changed, right? We think we can hide that from God, or I can hop on the train and I can go downtown and God's not going to find me there because I work down there and then I'll come back here and I'll be a good Christian here. No. Or look at what happened to the relationship between Adam and Eve the moment they sinned, starting to blame, make excuses for, pass it off on someone else. No wonder Christ would say so much about relationships because relationships get affected by sin in the world, by my sin and yours. So who are those people you have a relationship with? Well, it includes people like, well, like that neighbor of mine who likes to dump his grass clippings and it ends up being partly on my backyard and partly on his. Or those kids that play in the fellowship hall while we're having a meal in there and the balls are bouncing and it gets kind of loud and sometimes the balls come into the into the table area. Or it's like that guy who's that parent that's at my son's volleyball match and and he's making comments about how my son is playing and doesn't realize that's my son. You know, and those are mine. Okay? But you've got yours. Those relationships that are challenging, where, where people aren't, maybe aren't so nice to you. It's that coworker that just kind of rubs you wrong. It's that fellow student that, that you know is maybe cheating sometimes and getting a better grade than you are um, because you're trying hard and you're doing it by the book. It's a whole host of people that you're around. You fill in the blank. You know who that is. Jesus says, this is how we deal with them based upon who we are in Jesus Christ. And it's radical, isn't it? It's crazy, it's shocking that Jesus would call us to do this, but yet, what does he call us to do? Two words, light and salt. We are to be light and salt to the world. And one of the ways that we show that, as he says in these verses, is the fact that we are people who know what it's like to give. And we are. We, of all people, know what it's like to give. First of all, because we've seen how much God has given to us. We see and we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know that when Christ died for us, we were enemies of God. God still loved us enough to send us a savior. We know that his love for us is unconditional. We know how much we sin and how much we need forgiveness. If anybody, that's the blessed, we know how poor we are in spirit. So because we know how much God has given us, it certainly affects us to be people who give. But there's a challenge to that, isn't it? (laughs) Of all people, we know that God is the giver of everything. Of all people, we know that every single thing that we have comes from God. And that we never really lose anything that we get from God. Even what we give away, we don't really lose because it's still God's. Let me give you an example. How many of you remember President Jimmy Carter? Okay, peanut farmer from Georgia, right? Remember Jimmy Carter? Raise your hand if you remember Jimmy Carter. Or if you heard about Jimmy Carter, if you read about Jimmy Carter. When Jimmy Carter was president, two things I remember primarily. Number one, 55 mile an hour speed limit. Okay, I remember that because I was living in Nebraska at the time and going to school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, driving 55 miles an hour down I-80. Need I say any more? 
It was a long trip. The other thing I remember about Jimmy Carter was he told us we need to conserve water. We can't waste water. And, and I got a little freaked out. I thought, man, we really can't waste water because we need it for so many things. How, we, we can't waste water until we began to realize, you know what, we never lose water, right? Have we learned that from science? We don't lose, it just changes forms. It changes form and eventually it comes cycling back. And I thought, I kind of go, Phew, because we need water. Now here's, a, here's the example. The same is true with every single thing that God gives. Whatever I give away of what God gives, whether that's in my regular offering that I give, or what I give away when I see someone in need, even if someone were to take something of mine, as Jesus talks about here, you never really lose it because it's always God's. It's always God's. And we know of all people, and we trust God that anything that we give away, God is going to continue to take care of us. It wasn't ours in the first place. God blessed us with it in the first place. So we, we know, we know that it always belongs to God. Like that water, it just keeps getting cycled around and it always belongs to God. Therefore, we should be people who are characterized by giving. Regular giving like we do, recognizing that he's blessed us and he's given us the opportunity to be able to be a blessing to other people in what we give, but also recognizing that we trust him, that he's going to take care of us. Now, let me do a sideline a little bit. I don't want to pick on people, but TV preachers sometimes give us the impression that when you become a Christian, you're going to be blessed with financial blessings, that your life's going to be better, that you're going to have more. But you know what? In some ways, if we follow what Jesus says in that scripture reading, we may have less, less things physical because we see needs and we respond as we've been given by God. And so in a way, we may have less. We probably should have less because of who we are in Jesus Christ. But yet that's what it means to be light and to be salt we stick out. We bring light into the darkness. Let's do a little more. Go to the next verses. Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said, love your enemy or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons and daughters of your father in heaven. Wow, that's radical, isn't it? Because when you look around our world, this is what we see. This is what we see, kind of a grudging sort of spirit that, that, that we have as human beings. We see the effect of sin all over in the world. According to the world standard, it is do unto others before they do unto you, right? Or it's do unto others as they do unto you. That's what our world tells us. Our world says there's this sense of fairness, right? And it's not fair what I have, so therefore it's okay for me to take. Or our world says there should be kind of this tit for tat kind of thing. Or, or, or what just fairness is all about. In other words, it's dark. It's dark in this world of ours. And we see it every day. We see it in a rudeness on, on the highway when people cut us off or other things as we're driving our cars. We see it in people walking right by, people who are in need and things like that. We look at that and we, and we wring our hands and we say, the world has become so dark. But think about it. The darker the world becomes, the easier it is for you and I to be a light in that darkness. Because when it's dark, it doesn't take much light, right? Even if we do just a little bit of what Jesus talks about right here, loving our enemies, doing good to those who aren't good back to us, even if we shine just a little bit of light, it's gonna be seen in that darkness. Even if we're just a little bit salty, it's gonna show up because of the bland world that we live in. And what an opportunity we have. If we follow the way Jesus talks about there, not only we will be a little bit of a light, we will be a blinding light. And when you and I live in this way, when we go out of our way, when we go the extra mile, it's even an expression we use, when we turn the other cheek, oh my gosh, the brightness of that light is incredible. And that's what Jesus is calling us to. Our world is dark without you and me and the light of Christ shining through us. And think of all the opportunities we have. More and more we talk about our Christian freedoms being taken away. Darker world, 
greater opportunity for us to be light. More and more we see our world changing morally. Darker world, greater opportunity for you and I to let that light shine. So those boys in the fellowship hall that are making noise and banging the basketballs, and I look and say someone should do something about them, I need to do something. And I need to speak up. And I need to say to them lovingly and find out where they're at and talk with them and develop a relationship with them. My neighbor who's dumping the grass clippings on my backyard, I need to go talk with him. And I need to get to know him better. And I need to develop a relationship with him. He may continue to dump his grass clippings on my backyard, but you know what? I'm called to love. I'm called to radically be a light in the darkness. And you take whatever situation you see where you're looking at that situation and you're saying somebody needs to do something about that and that somebody is probably me and you. Why? Because you and I are called to be salt and light to our world. And it's a dark world and it's a pretty bland world out there. You and I, by the power of the gospel, by the power of Jesus Christ, being who we are as sons and daughters of Christ, we are that light and that salt. And what's the model? <laughs> Here it is, the last verse of our text for today. Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And perfect means without sin. <laughs> It means without sin. Your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus Christ is perfect. He is without sin. Your heavenly Father's love for you is perfect. Aren't you glad? Because that means he loves you perfectly, unconditionally, every single day, and he will not stop. Your forgiveness of sins that he has won for you is perfect. It's complete. There's nothing left there to be added. There's no way in the world that you can do something so bad that God says, I cannot forgive you. Christ has won it for you perfectly. You have a com perfect, complete, lacking nothing Savior and God in whom you put your faith. Aren't you glad? That every day you can wake up knowing that his love for you is perfect. His forgiveness for you is perfect. When he makes a promise to you and says, I'm with you always, he is with you always perfectly. Always. And you and I, stumbling towards greatness, as my friend says, which is awesome, Stumble towards that greatness, towards that perfection, striving for it every single day. Why? Because our Savior calls us to that. Are we saved by being perfect? Thank you, we're not. We are saved in the perfection of Jesus Christ, who lived our life perfectly for us, who gave the perfect sacrifice for us, who in his love and his grace then has forgiven us all of our sins, and he makes us perfect. But every day from now until the day he calls us home to heaven, you and I will be striving towards that perfection. That goal is before us. Will we ever reach it this side of heaven? No, but we'll continue to strive towards it. What's it look like? <laughs> look at that text again. Loving our enemies. Doing good to those who don't do good back to us. Giving in the opportunities we have. Why? Because we know our Heavenly Father, our perfect Father, and we follow him by the grace of God, by the grace of God. And we thank him for that precious gift and live out that thanks every single day. In the name of Jesus, amen.